So uh, we saw last week, we finished up chapter 3 last week, and we saw the charge against the daughters of Zion. We, we uh, dove into that, and, and that, that began back in verse number 16 of chapter 3. And um, I just I saw chapter verse sixteen, chapter two. I'm like, that's not what I what thought it would say. Sixteen of chapter three, uh, he he begins to say concerning the daughters of Zion. Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet. So the charge against them, they were full of pride. They had no shame. They were a sexually immoral people. They were consumed with outward appearance. And we saw that as we continued to go down from verse number six. 16, that everything they did to, to decorate themselves, and there was were uh, there were lots of accessories, right? There were lots uh, of of ways in which they decorated themselves, and it was all about look at me. That was the point to it all. It was very self-centered. It was it was had to do with outward appearance, no concern for the heart. But then we saw in, in beginning in verse number uh, 25. And then all of this is being brought down. Not just down, but, but the whole thing is coming down. We've been looking at charge after charge against the people starting in, in chapter number 2. And so now in verse 25, The men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in, in the war, and her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. So desolation here, what a difference compared to what we saw in chapter 16 in the attitude of these that God brings charge against. But here's what I want you to see and here's what I want us to understand today. The Lord just blessed. When you get down to the end of chapter 3 and she is brought low and she's lamenting and mourning and sits desolate on the ground, God just blessed. And we're going to see that as we get into chapter 4 now. In chapter 4, and verse number 1, it says, And in that day. And I told you we had to keep our title because we were getting to this point right here. Chapter 4 is really what got me started in this study. And when I read chapter 4, and verse number 1, and it said, In that day, well, what's the obvious question? What day? Right? I want to know what day. In what day did this take place in that day and so hold your place and back up to chapter number 2 and this is where we got our title in verse 11 of chapter 2 and verse 17 of chapter 2 verse 11 says the lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted that's our title and what's the rest of it say in that day we're talking about the day in which the Lord alone shall be exalted. Verse number 17. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted. In that day, right? He says it twice in chapter number 2. So this is the day that we've been looking towards. This is the day that we told, were told was coming in chapter number 2. The day in which the Lord alone would be exalted. And in that day, now we see... In verse number 1, seven women shall take hold of one man. Say, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. We will eat our own bread. Uh, hold your place and, and read, let's read 2 Thessalonians 3.12. What what's that talking about? They're not saying what they're not saying, and it may sound like it uh, as we read it in the English, but... What they're not saying is that, you know, let us do what we want. They're not trying to cast off headship, say let us do what we're, we want. We're self-sufficient. We'll submit to no one. That's not what these women are saying. They're saying like in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse number 12, uh, as he's exhorting those that were, that were previously, if you read up back in verse number 10, he's talking about those that, uh, uh, that uh, the instruction when Paul said, when we were there among you, we instructed you that if anyone wouldn't work, they shouldn't eat. For we hear that there are, uh, uh, there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now, we need to understand something. God designed us to labor. Work was not an effect of the fall. Okay, when God created Adam in the garden, he, was, he had a job, right? He created him to tend the garden. Now, oh, the, all the suffering aspects of work, that happened after the fall, right? The thorns and the briars and all those sort of things. That you're going to do it in the sweat of your brow now. That happened after the fall. But God designed man from the beginning to work and labor. 
every one of us have that responsibility. When we read the end of chapter number 3, um, you're starting from 16 on, we saw people that weren't laboring. We saw people that had too much time on their hand. Uh, uh, Brother Gene mentioned to me afterwards last week in Ezekiel about the, the sin of Sodom. As God was bringing this charge against Israel, He said, you're like them in that there's fullness, there's idleness and fullness of bread. Same issues, right? A rich, affluent people, plenty of time on their hands and plenty of money to spend. Not a laboring people. And so here the Apostle Paul says, you're supposed to labor. Listen, if someone won't labor, they shouldn't eat. And that's true for everybody. Parents, we got to teach these kids from the very beginning. You have a job to do. I worked with a guy, he said his dad would get him up on Saturday morning and say, get out of bed, boy, this ain't no free, work, free ride. Go cut the grass, right? you got a job to do. You have responsibility. And so uh, uh, there were those that they weren't working, but they were busy bodies among them. And, and his instruction is in verse number 12, Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. And that's what's happened in chapter number 4 now. That's the effect of this humbling, right? They have been brought very low at the end of chapter number 3. And now you've got seven women say, because remember, the, the men are gone. Chapter 3 said that thy men shall fall by the sword and thy mighty in the war. And now everybody's been brought low and you've got women, instead of saying, hey, give me stuff, they're saying, they'll take hold of one man and say, hey, we'll eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Just, just let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. There's reproach upon us because we are unmarried, because we haven't born children. You, you can, we won't go there for time's sake, but you can look back at Genesis 30 and verse number 23, and you'll see in various places that they use this term about God has taken away my reproach because He, he blessed the woman's womb and she was able to give birth. So in, in marriage and in birthing, uh, uh, the, that was a common phrase there. God has taken away our reproach. So just let us, you know, we don't want to be a bother, in other words, is what they're saying. Uh, the, these words are conveying an attitude of, of thankfulness, right? An attitude of contentment. And it's totally different than what we saw at the end of chapter number 3. Where there was no end to the stuff that they wanted, right? There's just a constant appetite for more and more and more. No, never satisfied. Here they're like, hey, just let us be called by your name and we're thankful for that. You see the difference in, in, in the spirit in chapter 4 and verse number 1 compared to what we saw at the end of chapter number 3, what, what brought about that change? The humbling at the end of chapter number 3. What a change in attitude. Men couldn't give them enough money to satisfy their need for useless things, but now they're satisfied with the bare minimum. They don't want to be a bother. Just take away our reproach. The men are gone. There are only a few available. The point is everyone has been brought low. The people have been humbled. And, and when I read this about seven women taking hold of one man and say, let us be called by your name to take away our reproach, I think about Hosea chapter 2. Hosea chapter 2. And the Lord talks about a people here who has been humbled and the effect of that humbling in Hosea chapter number 2. Mm, is this the right verse? Let's see. Yes. All right. In Hosea 2 and verse number 16, and it shall be at that day. We've got another at that day, right? At that time, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishai, and shalt call me no more Baali. Does anybody have a marginal reference there as to what Ishai means? They shall call me what? My husband. My husband. They shall call me my husband, and no more my Lord. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name, and, and so forth. So there's an identification with God as being the one that they need. And I thought about what Brother Gene, when he preached about the woman at the well, right? She had had all these other men, and they had been insufficient. And now she finds, hey, here's a man 
This is what I was looking for, right? Couldn't find this in anybody else, but now there's one that told me everything that I ever did. There's a man that's set apart above all the rest. And so I think about that where they were humbled there in Hosea, and now they're going to seek the Lord as their husband. And so what do we see in verse number 2 here? What do we see as the result of this humbling? In that day, again, right? In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. The branch of the Lord. Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. In Jeremiah 23, in verse number 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous... What? Branch. Branch. You know, I'm thankful for Brother Tommy. If it wasn't for Brother Tommy, there'd be nobody to respond to us, Brother Gene. I mean, I'm guilty too, but thank you, Brother Tommy. <laughs> Somebody is talking back to us. Thank you, Brother. Uh, I will raise unto David a righteous branch. It's really just that Brother Tommy's faster than everybody else, cause, so he's already there, right? He always won those Bible, Bible drills in Sunday school. Uh, so that righteous branch. Now, in this verse here, the translators capitalize the word, right? Because they wanted us to understand he's talking about deity. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, right? He's that righteous branch of David. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. If we're not convinced by that verse, listen to the next one. In his days Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. That's got to be Christ, right? So this is the branch. And when we, when we go over here to chapter number 4 and verse number 2, that's who it's talking about. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. This humbling has resulted in the exaltation of the branch. And if we don't get anything else today, what I want us to embrace and understand and rejoice in is the blessing of humbling. Because when you see a day like today and you look back in Isaiah's day and you say, it looks just like Isaiah's day, you know what we need to come back to the place so that the branch is exalted? We need a humbling. It's necessary. You raise up a child and you don't correct any of his wrongdoings and you just let him continue, you continue to bless and bless and bless, you're going to have a spoiled brat on your hands. But if you apply the rod of correction and that child is humble, you're going to have a different outcome. Amen. They're humbled at the end of chapter number 3. There is a totally different attitude beginning in verse number 1 of chapter 4. Chapter number 2, I mean verse number 2, the branch is exalted. And that's what we want, right? Isn't that what we want, church? Don't we want our Lord to be exalted? And so here's my warning to you. When you live in a day like in Isaiah's day, and there's prospering, and there's plenty, you better hang on to it loosely. You better be ready to give it up. You better use your time wisely and don't get caught up in the idleness that they were caught up with here. We need a humbling of the Lord. The humbling of the Lord brought forth the exaltation of the branch and resulted in blessing for the righteous. It says in verse number 2 that the branch of the Lord shall will be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. There are going to be those that escape. And, you know, we, when we went through chapter number 3, we, we saw where in the middle of all this condemnation and this judgment that, that Isaiah is, is, um, is revealing is going on already among them. It's like God stops the prophet and says, Hey, I know this is strong. 
make sure you say to the righteous in verse number 10 that it shall be well with him for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. You see that coming to pass in verse 2 of chapter 4. The fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. They're eating the fruit of their doings. The, the, the blessing of God that was promised in verse number 10 for the righteous is coming to pass. We were encouraged by that. And God's true to His Word. Church, cling to the promises of God. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Doesn't matter what it seems to be working against it. Faith calls us not to embrace, you know, the possible. Faith calls us to embrace the, embrace the impossible, right? Because God said it. When you go through those that were possessors of faith in Hebrew, Hebrews 11, for example, Sarah, right? God's promising to bless a womb that's dead. It's not possible, humanly speaking. How can anybody be saved, the disciples said. Jesus said, with men this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Amen. So faith often prompts us not to just believe what's hard, to believe what's impossible. Because we're trusting in the one who is the object of true faith, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, and with whom nothing is impossible. So verse 10 Say it to the righteous. It's going to be well with them. They're going to eat the fruit of their doings. It's coming. You remain faithful to the Lord. You continue to trust in the Lord. Don't despise the humbling. It's working for your good, church. Isn't everything working for the good of those that love God and are the called according to His purposes? Look at Zechariah chapter number 4. Zechariah 4. In verse number 9, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of what? Small things. Remember they did. Remember whenever they laid the foundation of this temple here, there were those that wept because they had seen the glory of the previous temple. But they're encouraged here. Don't despise the day of small things. Don't despise the humbling. God's bringing forth glorious things through this. Don't despise the day of small things, for they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. When I read about those seven that takes my mind to the Spirit of God. You know, there were the seven lamps before the throne in Revelation, and it says these are the seven spirits of God. And that's exactly what the previous text is talking about. Verse number 6, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by what? My spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So don't despise the day of small things, of the smallness of things. It's a day when the glory of God is being recovered. Agree with the Spirit of God and rejoice that God is accomplishing His purpose. We ought to rejoice along with the Spirit of God, verse number 10 says. Because God is being glorified in this. God is bringing us to a place to understand man can't do it. It's not by power. Uh, it's not by might, as our brother says. It's not by individual strength. It's not by collective power. But it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. God's doing it in such a way that only God could do it. It's like Gideon. you got too many. Keep getting rid of them. Why? Because I don't want you saying when the victory is accomplished that you did it in your own strength. I want you to know that God did it. That it was by my spirit, saith the Lord. So men are being taught in this humbling where our true hope lies, and so rejoice in that. We know Psalm 119 67. Before I was what? I went astray. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Don't despise. The humbling. 
Don't despise the humbling. I worked with a brother that uh, was in a was in a car wreck that he shouldn't, humanly speaking, shouldn't have walked away from when he was 16. And uh, I, I, th I may have already told you guys about this. Now that I think about it, but um, he said he shouldn't have walked away from that. And he knows it was the Lord that preserved him, and he would tell people it was the Lord. He said he knew, you know, people, they, they always wanted to dismiss it and say, well, your adrenaline was high. I mean, he had he'd grabbed his sister out of the car who was, who was 18 at the time and had broken her hip. She couldn't walk. He just picked her up, this dead weight, and, and took her away from this car that was in flames. And he said he knew it was God. It wasn't him. But he said after a while, because every time he would tell people, we'd give the glory to God, every time he'd tell people that, no one wanted to hear it. He said after a while, he just quit saying it. He said every time he would, it would just he'd fall under heavy conviction. He knew he should have given God the glory, but he didn't. And then about ten years later, nine or ten years later, he found out that he had a a terminal disease that he should already be dead from now, as far as the doctors are concerned. And, and, and now, you know, he confesses that the Lord has saved him. And he, and he praises God for that humbling when he found out about that disease. He's like, thank God that He brought me low. He showed me His mercy in that first example and I failed to give Him the glory that He should have had. And God, in His great mercy, He humbled me again to bring me to Himself. Only a Christian can say something crazy like that. Thank God for my terminal illness. But when you recognize what God is doing in you, what God is doing through those circumstances, you can praise God for the humbling. I mean, you understand what Paul says when he says, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, right? How do those two go together? It does if you see the blessing that God's working through the sorrow, right? We don't sorrow as those who have no hope. We sorrow as those that hope we can sorrow and at the same time always be rejoicing because we're never without hope. And sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Let's, let's read verse 3 and we'll wrap up in Isaiah 4. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy. Even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. I, I, I'm reading this and, and, and these are things that I believe literally took place as, as God brought uh, Jerusalem, as he, as he brought Judah low and then He brought them up out of this. But I'm reading this and I'm, and I'm seeing the spiritual work of God glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ and gathering a people out of every kindred and nation and tongue that's going to be a holy nation. They shall be called holy in verse number 3. These are the ones, even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. What does it say about, uh, about the Lord's people in Ephesians 1, 4 that we're very familiar, familiar with? According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. They are written among the living. From the foundation of the world, a chosen people called to be holy, written among the living. Revelation 21 and verse number 27. Revelation 21 and verse 27. He says of this city that had no need of the sun, verse 23, glory of God did lighten it. Nations that are saved walk in the light of it, verse 24, kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Gates not be shut, there shall be no night there, there's no need, there's no enemies to guard against, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter, in verse 27, into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Our text said, 
He that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. I thought about this verse. Written in the Lamb's book of life. God is preserving a people. There were many that when you read of the humbling there in chapter number 3, they didn't make it to the beginning of chapter number 4, but there was a people that was preserved. A humbled people. But a people that had been made holy. A people that would glorify the branch of the Lord. I want to close with Isaiah 38, 17. Isaiah 38, 17. This is, these are the words of Hezekiah after he had been brought low and uh, was told initially by the prophet that he would die and then God extended his life by 15 years. And it says in verse 17, Behold for what? Peace. peace. I had great bitterness. The margin reads, Behold, for my peace I had great bitterness. But thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. I want to read this to you in another translation because to me it's a little clearer the way that they phrase it here. This is the ESV. It says, Behold, it was for my welfare that I had great bitterness. But in love you have delivered my life from the pit of destruction, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. I want to encourage you people of God this day. The humbling is a blessing. When you see the humbling, don't despise it. Don't despise the day of small things. God is working great and glorious things through His humbling. He's working the exaltation of the branch, and that's what we want. That's what we desire. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know what God's got planned for this, this nation in which we live, but I can tell you this, it will not be recovered unless there is a great humbling. That's, the way it's, that's what's always been necessary. So don't be deceived by these things. Don't buy into this. Don't give yourself over to the same things. If God gives it, thank the Lord for it, but hold it loosely. And know this, that if it's taken away, God's still going to take care of the righteous. And you be faithful. In such a day, he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved.